Good morning, everyone. Happy Resurrection Sunday out there, wherever you are in the world. We are near Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. Today is, this is the first Sunday church Bible study of June 5th, 2022. In case you're not familiar with this ministry, this service, we are called Restoration Fellowship. This is our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. If you go to the links, you will find the beliefs and many other things. <clears throat> uh, articles, we have many books published by Anthony and others. And we have links to other websites, Human Jesus, Christ Enemy Love, Jesus Kingdom Gospel. We also have the latest focus on the kingdom magazine which is a free monthly magazine that's been published now for more than 20 years by anthony and uh, the latest article there just click on the dates and if you click on june you should be able to see this a pdf electronic copy of june 2022 as you see there so please share this, uh, you can download it, share it with your friends, your family, and um, so that's the one. If you'd like to get a hard copy of this, as in the mail, as in paper copy, just go back to the homepage, focus on the kingdom.org, scroll down or go all the way down to the page, the homepage, and you will see this. Fill that out, please, and we shall send you a paper copy or what some call a hard copy of the Focus magazine. So please check that out. Also, we have the podcast, RF podcast. Again, go to links, click on podcast, and we have uploaded the full New Testament translation commentary from Anthony. So you can find all the books there from the New Testament only in audio form. As you can see there, the book of Revelation, Jude and so on. And so to scroll down this page and click on whatever you'd like to listen to. So that's read by Anthony and that's from his One God the Father, uh, translation that you can purchase through Amazon. So the full New Testament is there for you to listen to. And uh, thanks to Anthony for doing this uh, massive work of reading that is involved. And I hope you enjoy that. Okay, we will go to Anthony to open with prayer. To this Sunday, we are finishing the Gospel of John, chapter 12. And with that, uh, here's Anthony. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. That's a nice introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, by the miracle of the internet, then we're able to speak to people <clears throat> all over the place. Nothing could be better than that. More encouraging for us because we get a wider audience and we want these biblical truths to be understood. So thank you. We open our service every Sunday by reminding you of what's called the Shema. That's the hero Israel that Jesus quoted. The brilliant thing about the Shema is that Jesus in Mark 12 confirms the creed of Israel, which has been the creed of Jews forever. They didn't believe in a Trinity in those days. They had not heard of the Trinity. They believed that God was one person. So back there in Deuteronomy 6, God warned them never ever to depart from the definition of God as one person. So we are what's called biblical Unitarians. That's not Unitarian Universalists who are sort of more New Agey people. That's not us at all. We simply believe that God is one person, the Father. Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? And thousands and thousands of times God is a single person, I, him, his, me, myself, himself, thousands upon thousands of singular personal pronouns define who God is. So with that in mind, then I remind you, it goes like this in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, 
Adonai Echad. And if we translate that into the New Testament Greek, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We suspect that it isn't difficult to understand that one Lord is not two or three Lords. So Jesus is the Son of God, and John is helping us to understand that mightily. We get to John 17, 3, we have a marvelous definition of the one God from Jesus. But we're getting to that later. Today we'll be doing uh, John 12, verses 32 onwards. We'll go back to 32 and start right there onwards, hopefully to the end of that chapter. Okay, with that in mind then, I would invite you to pray with me that God will assist us in what we attempt to do this resurrection morning. Pray with me if you will. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this extraordinary technological miracle by which we can sit here at home and through the skills of all those people whose gifts you have used to discover how to do internet and computers and all of that amazing technology, we thank you for it. We pray that everybody listening this morning, this Resurrection Sunday, might benefit from what they hear from the words of Jesus in John's Gospel. We pray that your spirit, your operational presence and power would work in the minds of all of us. If we have questions, that they would be answered, that we can interact in and be part of the conversation. All of this, we pray, will happen this morning and that we can study to show ourselves approved to God. We are supposed to understand what we believe and above all, to share it with other people. May that process be furthered this morning in our attempt to deal with the words of Jesus in John, John chapter 12. Our prayer, my prayer this morning is offered to you, Father, and we praise you, Jesus, at the right hand of the Father too, as Messiah. We offer the prayer as Jesus commanded us to pray to the Father in the name of Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Anthony, as he said, will be back to continue the reading of John. We are in chapter 12. And before we do that, we have a youth lesson. This is part two of a youth lesson from Tracy. By the way, um, if you'd like to listen to her part one, just go to the Focus on the Kingdom YouTube channel. And that was last Sunday. It was part one. And uh, today's part two, before we go to that, just a reminder that this uh, material may not be appropriate for your younger children. If there's any younger children watching live or later as the recording. So we do offer a parental guidance that uh, might be advisable with this uh, youth lesson from uh, Tracy. So, all right, and with that, please uh, enjoy. Let's consider what many people do to justify killing babies, that is abortion. They change words so that what they are promoting is more palatable and it confuses people. They make you think that it really isn't as bad as it is. They call a baby that is being formed in its mother's womb a clump of cells or tissue. Well, that's true. We're all a clump of cells. The ones saying this though are just an older clump of cells and they're older because their lives were not snuffed out when they were younger. They call a baby a fetus instead of just a baby so that we don't feel guilty by ending the baby's life. Or they say ending the pregnancy, which is really ending the baby's life because you kill the baby if you end the pregnancy. And they do this so that more people will go along with their evil schemes. The problem is rather than calling the sin of abortion what it really is biblically, which is murder and child sacrifice, they simply say that the person is terminating a pregnancy. Being pregnant though is not a disease to be treated or terminated. 
terminating a pregnancy, that is, killing a baby, is not reproductive health care, as they call it. It is devising a plan to kill an innocent human being. Health care should help people, all people, and not kill them. Abortion is not a reproductive right for a woman. Abortion should not be an option when family planning. Again, it has nothing to do with health care, so don't let anyone fool you. What gets even worse today, now they want to allow parents to kill a baby who is on its way out or who has already come out of its mother. What is the logic of killing a baby that is being born or has already come out? At that point, if you didn't want it, couldn't you just give it to somebody else who did? Many people want to adopt. I know people who would gladly take a baby and give it a good life. And if you are in this position or somebody you know is in this position and they want to pursue a kinder option, please reach out to me and I can try to put them in touch with somebody that can help. If you had a plate of extra food and there was a starving person next to you, would you logically think that throwing it in the garbage is okay just because you're full or you don't want it? Or would it be more logical and kind to give your food to the starving person rather than putting it in the garbage? And that's really where those poor little babies end up, is in a garbage bag. Would it be any worse for you if you gave someone else the food? What would you lose in doing this? If you say, yes, I would lose something when we're talking about uh, killing babies, um, like that maybe you would have to take a year off of school or maybe you would need bigger clothes for a few months. Again, those are small things in, when it comes to those compared to killing an innocent child. And there really aren't that long of a time that you would have to sacrifice and maybe suffer a little bit in your own eyes. And again, there are people that are willing to help. So losing a year of school is much less tragic than losing someone's life. The baby loses the opportunity to learn to walk and talk. They lose the opportunity to get a degree or to study anything that they would like to, or to travel and to enjoy things like a sunset. They lose the opportunity to smile and laugh. They lose the opportunity to bring someone else a lot of joy and to be a blessing to other people. You know, many people take their clothes and other things to a thrift store rather than just throwing them out when they don't need them or want them anymore. Their conscience tells them that it would be kind to do that instead of wasting perfectly good clothes and just throwing them out. So even though it takes a little bit of time and some gas, they take them to the thrift store and they do that anyways. And typically afterwards, they feel pretty good about doing it. I think it is safe to say that most unwanted pregnancies and babies are not from rape. Like they claim a lot of times, that's the first thing they say, what if somebody's raped? Well, that happens and that's very sad. But as we said before, it's not worth doing something evil to someone else just because evil was done to you. But in reality, when looking at how many abortions are performed every single day, the majority of them are not from somebody being raped. Most babies were made by the pro-choice of two people. So if you don't want to make a baby, don't do what needs to be done to make a baby. It's that simple. And you will save yourself from many possible and really very gross diseases too. I live on a farm and if I don't want to get my socks dirty or wet, I will put on shoes or rubber boots. I choose to wear my rubber boots when I clean out the chicken coop because there is a high risk that if I don't, I would get chicken manure all over my socks. Only a selfish person would choose to kill a baby rather than to give it up for adoption. Yes, it may be a bit of a sacrifice, but maybe they should look at how others sacrificed for them. 
even if it was just carrying them for nine months while their body got ready to live outside of the womb, just like the little bird does before it hatches out of the egg. And if they chose to have sex, then maybe they should take responsibility for their choices and their actions. Most of you young people couldn't survive today without your mom or dad or another adult taking care of you, feeding you, buying you clothes, paying for a house to live in, driving you where you needed to go or providing a car for you. So with this crazy logic, then shouldn't they be able to abort you or kill you? That is, if they felt you were taking, a, too much, taking up too much of their time or their money and you were ruining their plans for their life since they had to think of you rather than just themselves and they had to plan their life around you rather than just living how they wanted to live. These people who think this way do not value life. Well, except their own, of course. And as the Bible says, they love death. For the one who finds me, and this is talking about wisdom, has found life and receives favor from the Lord. But the one who sins against me brings harm to himself. And all who hate me love death. God says to defend the cause of the poor and the fatherless, vindicate the oppressed and suffering, rescue the poor and needy, deliver them from the power of the wicked. Just like people who rehome puppies, babies are also better off rehomed or adopted out rather than killed. By not believing the wicked lies and speaking God's truth on this matter, this is how you can help defend the cause of not only the fatherless, but those whose mothers who don't want them either. This is how you can help rescue them and deliver them from the hands of the wicked. You can help show them God's love by speaking up for them because they can't talk and by helping them once they are born. So my dear young people, there is no such thing as pro-choice. There is either pro-life or pro-death. Those are the two choices. And consider what these words really mean. Either you are for the life of a baby and helping it to live, or you are for the death of the baby and killing it. Either way is pro-choice. You must choose. People have a choice and the choice is yours. God is your judge, not friends, not teachers, not big mouth politicians or news people. And what those people say does not sound like what God has said. So who will you listen to? Please listen wisely when you hear these things in school or on TV or on social media. Don't be made a fool and don't go along with them. Even if it's a big crowd of people and it's all your friends, Stand up for what is right and stand up for saving a baby's life rather than killing it. Be a voice for those who cannot yet speak, just like we try to help eagles that cannot yet fly. All right. Thank you, Tracy, for that youth lesson on a very important topic. And Tracy, as some of you know, is part of the Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions uh, Ministry. And this is her, the uh, homepage of that ministry that she's part of. Uh, please uh, visit and, uh, and give your support as best as you can, as, as best as God has enabled each of us to, to give. So... She has many other youth lessons there and uh, many, many things, as you can see from the links. And also thanks, uh, Tracy, for holding down the fort these last two weeks. We were away. Okay, let's see. I have a short um, sermonette. Oh, I shouldn't call it short sermonette. A sermonette, which means a short teaching. And this is on the opening words of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, I call it the way of the Lord. So I hope this helps you. In the beginning of his Gospel, Mark applies various Old Testament texts to both John the Baptist and his cousin, Jesus. Mark 1 verse 2, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And that's from Exodus 23, verse 20, and Malachi 3, 1. 
verse 3, the voice of one shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight, from Isaiah 40, verse 3. But Mark makes slight yet important changes to some of these texts from the Hebrew and Old Greek translation. For example, Mark changes Malachi 3, verse 1 from prepare the way before me, originally in reference to Yahweh, Jehovah, the one God of Israel, to prepare your way, now in reference to Jesus, the Son and Messiah of that one God. The reason for this change was to allow for a messianic interpretation of the texts, as opposed to Mark using it to somehow prove Jesus was literally Yahweh, Jehovah. That would actually make one Yahweh too many, according to the Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4, which Jesus himself calls the most important of all the commandments in Mark 12, verse 29. Furthermore, the expositor's commentary notes that in Malachi 3.1, the messenger is called Adon, the Hebrew for Lord, and not Yahweh, because it is Yahweh of hosts who is speaking. The passage does not address the issue of his deity or humanity. That's probably a reference by the commentary to the Godman doctrine of later church councils. For to do so would be out of keeping with pre-New Testament revelation and raise insoluble problems for Malachi's hearers. So the real point of Mark's use of these Old Testament texts was to mark the beginning of the kingdom gospel as preached by both the Baptist and his cousin Jesus. And like the angel leading Israel through the desert in the Old Testament days, according to that Exodus 23 passage, and the messenger who prepares the way for the Lord in Malachi 3 verse 1, later identified as the prophet Elijah in Malachi 4 verse 5, John the Baptist is guided by that same spirit that empowered them. This explains what Jesus says in Matthew 11, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Matthew here is obviously not using the word is in a literal way. Instead, John is Elijah means that John manifested and embodied that same messianic prophetic spirit of the person of Elijah in the Old Testament. Similarly, we can say Jesus is Yahweh, meaning that Jesus manifested and embodied all the attributes and activities of the one God of Israel, that is the Father of our Lord Christ. So for more on this interesting passage, from the Gospel of Mark. Um, I offer here two books for recommended reading. Dr. Uh, Daniel Kirk's A Man Attested by God, The Human Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels. And on the right, the book from Dr. Joel Marcus, The Way of the Lord, Christological Exegesis of the Old Testament in the Gospel of Mark. So it's a bit of a, <clears throat> read both books, but this subject, of course, needs very delicate handling of how uh, the way of the Lord, the Lord God, that is, in the Old Testament, can now be said to be the way of the Lord of his Messiah, Jesus, his only unique procreated son. So I hope that is helpful. Okay, so we will now turn to the main sermon at hand. Again, if you have any questions or comments, please, in the live chat, if you're watching this live, we ask you to please keep them to the main sermon at hand. Again, we are finishing the Gospel of John chapter 12 today, and this section um, is rather dense, <laughs> if that's the word. Uh, it merits uh, some uh, 
some commentary, extensive commentary, perhaps from Anthony and myself. Many interesting and valuable teachings here. So Anthony said he'll start from verse 32, I believe. But again, if you're watching live, we ask you to please keep your questions and comments to Anthony's main sermon at hand. So Anthony, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The Gospel of John is very popular in Christian circles, but we must remember that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are three corroborating accounts of Christianity there before you get to John. So you don't want to start with John necessarily. You want to get yourself grounded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke thoroughly, and also in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, which was the Bible that Jesus had, and he, growing up, you know, with his mother and father, going to the synagogue, he would have learned that Old Testament. And he knew, Jesus knew, by searching the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, that there was a person destined to come called the Messiah, the King. Messiah is simply somebody who is anointed by God. The kings of Israel were called Messiahs. You'll even find that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are actually called messiahs in one psalm. So these are people who are agents of God. They speak for God because they've been touched and influenced by the Spirit of God. Their minds have been opened to the truth. So Jesus saw his role, his destiny in the Hebrew Bible. He said, my goodness, I am that messiah. I am that messiah. So what do I do? I go around recruiting the members of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God gospel is what Mark talks about. You always start with the gospel of the kingdom in Mark chapter 1. And Jesus was recruiting the agents, the magistrates, if you like, the rulers, the management people for that future kingdom, which we haven't got yet, when the nations will beat their swords into plowshares, they'll never learn to blow each other up with guns or to kill each other with tanks. That's the kingdom of God, essentially. And it's your hope, too. So everything we're reading in John here bears on that stupendous destiny that lies ahead of you. So here we are in verse 32. As for me, Jesus said there, if I'm lifted up from the earth, and that's a reference to his being taken from the earth, at his ascension, and if you like, taken up and put on the cross before that. That was a lifting up in the cross as well, and later as he ascended to heaven where he now is. When that happened, I will draw like a magnet. Jesus is a magnet. Every person, everybody without distinction, has the opportunity, if they choose, to come to Messiah. I'll draw every person, every male, every female human being to myself. So we're trusting that you who are listening today have been magnetized by the enormous power of Jesus from heaven, where he sits as the son of man at the right hand of the Father, Psalm 110.1. We're hoping that you'll teach these things to your neighbors and anybody who's interested that you can start your own ministry via internet if that's what you choose to do. But somehow these informational facts about Jesus are essential. So in verse 33, John explains what Jesus says. It's a very good teaching method. A lot of John's style is to have Jesus say some somewhat mysterious things, and then John explains. So in verse 33, John reports that Jesus said this that lifting up thing to signify what kind of death he was about to die. The cross, the death of Jesus is absolutely essential, I remind you, for you and me, because Jesus became a curse on our behalf. He died in our place. We all have to die as sinners unless somebody generously steps in and says, look, I'll die on behalf of those people. We celebrate Jesus Sunday by Sunday. That's his resurrection. But three days earlier on Friday, he died. And so that's what John is telling us here in verse 33. Jesus, referring to that 
strange event in Numbers 21 when a serpent was put up on a step on a staff actually, and that was a picture of Jesus defeating the devil. The devil is the external fallen angel who is trying to ruin everybody, trying to ruin the world. He's a liar. And Jesus was lifted up on that stake to die in our place. And what happened then was the devil was defeated. Now, God hasn't put a stop yet to his activity. That will happen when Christ comes back fully. But potentially, in our lives, the devil has been defeated. So then the crowd replied. The crowd was an intelligent group of people. They were listening to Jesus' teaching. Huge crowd of people in verse 34. They replied to Jesus. We've heard from the law, from the Torah, that's the Old Testament Bible. We've heard from the law that the Messiah is going to remain forever. You bet they had. The law and the prophets and the writings, that's the threefold division of the Old Testament, the law, first five books, the prophets, all the prophets, and then the last third of the Old Testament called the writings. They had read there that the Messiah was going to remain forever, correctly. They saw that the Messiah was going to come to rule in the future kingdom, and that was going to go on uninterrupted in perpetuity forever and ever and ever so they said and they were good to question here jesus didn't stop their questioning and he doesn't stop ours either if we want to ask questions so what do you mean when you jesus say the son of man has to be lifted up who is this son of man they didn't understand numbers 21 and they had no reason to understand it until it's explained. So it was a type in Numbers 21, when Moses lifted up this serpent in the wilderness, that was a picture, an example, a model of the future crucifixion of Jesus, apparently. Now we get to the fulfillment of that typology, that, that model, that example shown by Moses in Numbers 21. We get to the fulfillment of it when we get to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And that's about to happen here. He's very shortly now before his own crucifixion. So the question was a good one. The Son of Man, as I'm explaining to you, is, as I would continue to explain to you, the Son of Man means the human being, capital H, capital B. Jesus is not God. That would mean there would be two gods. And Jesus didn't believe in two gods. He never, ever said, I'm God. Never, ever said, I'm God. That would have been quite out of keeping with his background as a Jew and really quite uh, problematic, to put it lightly. No, the Son of Man, that's himself. His favorite title for himself, by the way. Why was that? Because he knew the tendency of human beings to get things wrong. He could foresee the tendency that they were going to over-explain and mis-explain who he was and call him God, making two gods, and later with the Holy Spirit, three who were God. You don't need that. That antagonizes Jews to this day. It antagonizes Muslims to this day. So he refers to himself constantly as the human being, the Son of Man, from Daniel chapter 7. All of this you're going to have to explain patiently to any inquiring neighbors and friends of yours. So from Daniel 7, you'll find the Son of Man is the one who's going to come to rule the world. He's going to rule the world. The world's going to be under new management when Jesus comes back. Right now, the devil is largely, with God's permission, in control of everything. You'll find that in 1 John Five, uh, First John five nineteen, which speaks of the devil being the god of this age and the whole world. The apostle John said is in the power of the devil. So in thirty six, then, if you're walking in darkness, darkness is a symbol of chaos and confusion. You don't know where you're going. So then, you are to have the light. Jesus is the light of the world. But he also said of Christians in Matthew 5, you are to be lights. So are you a shining light in this world? 
Are you a beacon of light, full of truth, ready to explain the meaning and the destiny of mankind and your destiny to all of your inquiring friends? So you're to believe in the light, as to believe in Jesus, the truth that he spoke, the light that he enlightened the world with, so that you also became, must become sons of light, children of light, products of light. Children of light simply means products of light. That's why Jesus said, you Christians are to be the light of the world. And when he'd said this, he went off and hid himself from them. You know, they were trying to arrest him. It wasn't quite the moment yet for him to be arrested and to be falsely tried and crucified. So he escaped from them for the time being. And now in verse 37, we get this rather tragic summary from John. Even though Jesus had performed so many symbolic miracle signs you remember what they were the turning of the water into wine was the first one that was water into alcohol at a wedding and then the healing of a blind man the feeding of thousands of people there were seven signs in john's gospel seven staggering miracles ending with the raising of lazarus from the dead lazarus having been dead for four long days Jesus was able to call him out of the tomb. Can you imagine that? What would the news programs have made of those stories? I hope they would have treated them with utmost astonishment and respect. But though Jesus had performed <clears throat> so many miracles in their presence, they still refused to believe in him. So the question for us today is, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? That in itself is a somewhat vague phrase. People online are inviting you to believe in Jesus. What does that mean? <clears throat> I'll tell you what it generally means for the public, and you're going to have to work hard to correct this. It simply means that you're to believe that he died and rose. I quote the famous words of Billy Graham, not trying to be hard on Billy Graham, but we do have to try to show that we can be a little bit more explanatory of what it means to believe in Jesus. And he is, Billy Graham says, that Jesus came to do three days work, to die and to be buried and to rise. And I have to tell you plainly, that is just false. What in the world do you think Jesus was doing for those three years before he died? Nothing? Was he lolling around at the beach? Of course not. So you're going to answer your friends on this point by quoting Luke 4.43, where Jesus said, I came to preach the gospel about the kingdom, which is the destiny of you, the destiny of the world, the end of all warfare, peace on earth, paradise restored. I came to announce that and to recruit the members of that kingdom. That's why I was sent. That's Luke 4.43. I shouldn't have to quote that verse to you, but I have to add it every Sunday because there are people who are new to what we're doing. So Luke 4.43, you must believe in what believe, what Jesus believed. That's in the hope of the future kingdom. And so then John gives us a sermon here, reporting what Jesus had just said and commenting on it in verse 38. This statement about people refusing to believe, this was a fulfillment, John reports, of the message of Isaiah. The word word doesn't have a capital W. It should never have a capital W on John 1.1. 1, 1. That's another story. The word, what Isaiah spoke is his word, little w-o-r-d. And what did Isaiah say, as we call him in Britain, I think Isaiah in America, what was it that Isaiah said so convincingly and so uh, clearly when he said, Lord, addressing God, Imagine Isaiah now in the uh, 8th century BC saying to God in prayer, who in the world has believed our gospel message? Isaiah was finding exactly the same difficulty that you might experience today, that people just don't want to believe what Jesus taught. They make up their own version of the gospel. Don't want to do that. So in a rather uh, impassioned plea, shall we say, Isaiah said to God, Lord, 
Kyrie, Lord God, who has believed our gospel message? Not many is the implication. And who has the arm? That's the symbol of God's activity. Your arm is where you, you function, where you do everything. Who has the arm of the Lord? God's stretched out active arm and hand. Who's it been revealed to? That's a good question. Sometimes you wonder, will nobody believe these truths? It's going to be a struggle. So that's an old, old question from the times of Isaiah. And then John goes on to say, to report in verse 39, this is why they were unable to believe. I like that. This is why. That's Luke 4.43. The reason I was sent was to preach the kingdom. That's why I was commissioned. That's the whole point of Christianity there in Luke 4.43. And this is a similar statement. This is why they were unable to believe. Ah, that gets my attention. Why are people unable to believe in Jesus? Well, here's the answer, because Isaiah, Isaiah, if you like, also said this. So he quotes then another passage from Isaiah. God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and not see and understand with their hearts and be converted and i would heal them oh i see yes i get it god has blinded their eyes now this is not calvinism i hasten to add here this doesn't mean that they didn't make any choice on their own there are always two sides to the coin yes god has allowed a major uh, quantity of blindness and hardening of hearts, but that's always with the choice of us human beings. I, I'll tell you why, because God said often, choose life. If God tells you to choose, he's not lying. He's not saying, well, you choose life, but in fact, of course, I've already chosen that one way or the other. That's just nonsense. No, God, in response to the blindness of people, their willful hardening of their hearts, remember that Pharaoh in egypt hardened his heart it also says that god hardened his heart god hardened pharaoh's heart but then pharaoh also hardened his own heart two sides of the coin lest you fall for some terribly cruel calvinism which says that you don't have any choice you absolutely do have a choice and if you believe with your heart as to say you believe what jesus said I repeat that, you believe what Jesus taught, not just that he died on the cross, that's very important, absolutely essential, but you must believe the teachings of Jesus that we're studying here in the Gospel of John and also, of course, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you believe correctly, then you can get converted, turned around. Converted, you know what conversion it means. It means a completely new approach. You get a new self. And God would be healing you, not necessarily healing you physically of all your diseases, that's true. Healing has a broader meaning in the New Testament. God will see that your minds are opened and this will be a gigantic uh, enlightenment of your brain. And Isaiah said these things because he saw Messiah's glory. Now you have to be careful with that verse. It does say in Isaiah, that he saw the glory of Adonai, the Lord God. He did. But that wasn't the only uh, thing that, that was seen. Isaiah saw the glory of Messiah. That means the whole kingdom vision. People fasten on that one text in Isaiah 6 to say, there you go. Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus must have been at the right hand of the Father. That's not right. No, no. There are other prophecies of the glory or kingdom there there's the one in isaiah 6 thank you the year that king Isaiah died i saw the lord god that is adonai not adoni the human lord but adonai the lord god yahweh sitting on a throne high and lofty and the hem of his robe filled the temple it's a heavenly vision and there were all sorts of super angels in attendance each with six wings. This isn't a marvelous scene. With two they covered their faces, 
covered their feet with two more, and with two they flew. And then they addressed the Lord God, and they said, Holy, 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 three times over, maximum holiness is the Lord of hosts. When you have L-O-R-D in all caps in your Hebrew Bible, that means that the word behind it is Yahweh or Yehovah. Doesn't matter how you pronounce it. You don't want ever to get in a fuss about how to pronounce it. Yehovah might be right. Yahweh is fine. The Lord God of hosts. That's the one God of Israel whom Jesus celebrated in the Shema. And the whole earth is full of his glory. That was not the only text uh, that was referred to there. There were many things in Isaiah about the glory of the kingdom, which apply, of course, to Jesus, who is coming back to establish that kingdom. So that's a marvelous scene there. You should contemplate that and, and marvel at the glory of the one God of Abraham and Isaac. We're back now to chapter 12 of John. Now we get to, from verse 44, we're going to get to a very instructive crying out of Jesus. I commented that in verse 40, 44, but 43 or 42, let's go back to that. Nevertheless, many of them did believe in him, even among the religious rulers. But now notice this caution. But because of the religious establishment, the church of the day, they were scared to confess him openly. Watch out there. Are you in any way scared of proclaiming publicly what you believe? Are you in awe of this establishment so much that you're more afraid of them than you are in the proper fear of God? So that, look at this lesson here. They, these many who really believed in Jesus, they'd seen the miracles, they would not be banned from the synagogue. Uh oh, I see. They preferred to be popular in the local church, the local synagogue. They wanted the approval of the local rulers and leaders, but they weren't going to buck that system for fear of being excommunicated. Huge lesson for some of us, for many of us here. What are we going to do with the truths that we've learned? And the reason for this, another sermon from John here, these people who are condemned in this passage, loved the praise of men. They liked to be approved by churches and by friends. They loved the praise of men more than the praise and approval of God. Isn't that a staggering statement? So you say to yourself, am I more in love with the approval of human beings? Am I afraid of bucking the system? Maybe they might think I was a cult or they might think I was some sort of errorist but you must love the truth in order to be saved. And so in your notes here, I would caution you, I would advise you strongly always to write 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, where Paul said, because people didn't love the truth in order to be saved. Oh, oh in order to be saved. So loving the truth is a matter of salvation. And in response to people not loving the truth for salvation, in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, Paul actually says that God will give you over to a spirit of delusion that you'd wind up believing lies. That's the last thing you want to do. So caution yourself carefully. You must operate from the truths that you have learned from Scripture on pain of losing out on a relationship with God. Now, that's what we come to then in the climax of this chapter. In verse 44, then Jesus shouted. I want to tell you that that doesn't happen often in the gospel, but in your notes, I would invite you to write Luke 8.8. 8. Easy to remember. We won't turn there for the sake of time. But in Luke 8 and verse 8, after giving the parable of the sower, it says in Luke 8 verse 8, it says that Jesus would customarily yell, shout. So I take it he didn't raise his voice shouting most of the time. But in Luke 8.8, 8, he did when he gave the parable of the sower. So important 
because it was showing the seed message of the kingdom of God gospel, which has to be sown in you. So when he got to explaining that in Luke 8, 8, he yelled. And here's another place where Jesus, summarizing the whole of Christianity in these wonderful verses we're about to look at, Jesus shouted, raised his voice, yelled. He underlined with three red lines. He got his markers out, whatever you want to put it. But he cried out, I want to stress that. The person, man or woman, whoever it is who believes in me does not believe in me. Oh, wait a minute, what's that? That's a clever way to teach, by the way. The person who believes in me doesn't believe in me. Well, let's read on. Doesn't believe in me, but in the one who commissioned me. I get it. Jesus' whole point is that if you were listening to him, you're listening to God who is inspiring him. <clears throat> I get it. If you're listening to Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, <clears throat> then you might as well be living, listening to God, not because Jesus is God, but because he's so perfectly well commissioned as God's agent. I'll help you read the the rest here and then get you to comment, Anthony, to help you with the reading. Uh, let's see, verse 45. And the one who sees and understands me understands him who commissioned me. I was born into the world as a light so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If someone hears my words and does not obey them, I do not judge him. I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The person who rejects me and refuses to accept my teachings has, di has this as his judge. The gospel of the kingdom word I have spoken will judge him on the last day of this age. Uh, verse 49, I have not spoken on my own initiative, but the father himself who commissioned me has given me a command as to what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that his command means life in the coming coming age. So the things I speak, I speak just as the Father instructed me. Right. That is a wonderfully instructive passage of Scripture. So make, let's make sure that we've understood this. You have to believe in Jesus. But you then have to say, what does that mean to believe in Jesus? So we're going to unpack that. Let's have that back on the screen a moment, Carlos, if we could, so we can look at it. Okay, if you are believing in Jesus, you automatically then, you're believing in the one who commissioned him, who is the Father. And then look how John unpacks these words of Jesus so that you can understand. The one who sees and understands, that word seeing in John's gospel doesn't just mean seeing with the eye, with the physical eye, it means who understands. The one who understands Jesus understands the one who commissioned Jesus. That's to say, the Father. I get it. So understanding is critically important. I was born into the world. That means to say he began life as every human being must in the womb of his mother. To be born into the world simply means to be born. And he was when he became a minister at the age of uh, 18 or 21, let's say, what, whatever age he was exactly, or 30 years old, possibly, he's a light. The light. So that everybody who believes in him, you say, wait a minute, what is believing in him? It means copying his teaching, understanding his teaching. He's going to explain that in the next verses. Everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. So believing in Jesus then come, means coming out of darkness, a failure to understand, into the light of understanding. Now Jesus, being a very good teacher, repeats this same idea in other words. Note this in verse 47. If someone hears my word, oh, I get it. You've got to hear the words of Jesus, not just see him die on the cross. That's very important. But you must begin by hearing the words, the teachings, the sayings of Jesus. And if you hear the words of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus, 
If you don't obey them, oh, oh, how important is obedience then? Obedience to the words of Jesus is everything on this text here. And in your notes, you can take Hebrews 5, 9 speaks of salvation. I won't turn to it for the sake of time, but Hebrews 5, 9 says that salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. So the Hebrews writer was copying exactly what we have in verse 47 and giving a similar warning. You've got to hear the words of Jesus. And you begin there in Mark chapter 1, which is the beginning of the gospel. You don't begin with the death of Jesus. You begin at the beginning of the gospel, Mark chapter 1 and Mark 1, 14 and 15. So if you read those words and don't obey them, then you fail to repent. The first command Jesus ever gave in Mark was to repent and believe. Repent, that's to say, in order to believe. In other words, stop not believing in the gospel of the kingdom. That's what's being cautioned here. This is a marvelous summary of Jesus' whole ministry. So if somebody hears my gospel of the kingdom words and doesn't do anything with them, I, Jesus, I'm not going to judge him right now. He doesn't strike you dead because his main purpose was not to come to officiate as a judge in the world now. His main object was to save the world. All right, so we're talking about salvation here. Then he, he expands his idea as a good and brilliant teacher that he is, would do. Note, the person who rejects me, what does that mean? Oh, I've accepted Jesus, people say. What do you mean? You may have rejected him, actually, if you haven't followed the line here. The person who rejects Jesus that's to say, refuses to accept my teachings <coughs> as this, as his judge. Uh-oh, here's the point of judgment. The gospel of the kingdom word, the word I've spoken. And you say, well, what is the word that Jesus spoke? It's the gospel of the kingdom. So it all depends on your intelligent understanding of the word and gospel of the kingdom that's the issue for John and Jesus in this passage. So the kingdom word, I inserted that in my translation, the kingdom word, because the word in the Bible is not just the Bible. People hold up the Bible and say, I got the word of God here. It's not entirely wrong. You've got the words of God, we believe in the Bible. But the word, singular, Greek word logos, is a summary of the gospel message as Jesus preached it. And watch out now at the end of 48. That word of the kingdom is going to be your judge on the last day of this age. So you better get busy. We had all of us better get busy now understanding and obeying the gospel of the kingdom. And then we'll be secured against being judged adversely in the future. And then he repeats the same idea in 49. Jesus says, I've not spoken. The words I gave, the teachings I gave, the sayings I've gotten recorded here, as we know they are for us. Now, I didn't invent this. I, didn't, I don't make the rules. But the Father, the one God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the one God and Father of Jesus, he's the one who commissioned me. Jesus is what the Hebrew people call a shaliach, an agent, one sent. And an agent, if he's doing his job correctly, reflects exactly what the boss told him to do. A good son or a good daughter is one who obeys their parents. In the same way, Jesus has a parent, the father. The father is the one who actually brought him into existence in the womb of his mother by miracle. And the Father having commissioned him, Jesus is now perfectly fulfilling that agency principle. I find this very, very intense. You should ponder these words from 44 onwards very often. Because you're going to be judged whether you like it or not. We're all of us going to be judged and assessed and tested by that gospel word as Jesus preached it. 
Okay, back on the screen one more time, Carlos, for the rest of this. The Father commissioned me. He told me what to say. Isn't that amazing? It's the Father who told me what to say, Jesus said. What to say and what to speak. So every word of Jesus is utterly precious. And I would invite you to write in your notes here, John 6, 63. Let's turn to that one. In John 6, verse 63, the Spirit gives life. The flesh, that's to say you without any spirit, gets you nowhere, profits nothing. Then look at 63 of John 6. The words, the sayings, the teachings, the gospel of the kingdom words that I, Jesus, have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. I hope you take that one in fully. You need the words of Jesus. You need the words of Paul as well. Not saying for a moment you don't need the words of the whole Bible. You do. We all need the, the words of both Testaments. But especially the devil works at trying to get the words of Jesus away from you. Don't fall for that trap because as in Luke 8, 12 says, and here's an interesting thing for your notes. You have Luke 8, 12. I, I'll refer to it. In Luke 8, 12, the parable of the sower, whereas I've just finished saying in Luke 8, 8, he raised his voice and shouted. In Luke 8, 12, Jesus said, when anybody hears the word of the kingdom, that's what that word is, the gospel word of the kingdom. When anybody is exposed to it, hears it, and doesn't understand it as they should, Jesus said, the devil comes and snatches away that word of the kingdom so that they would not believe that word of the kingdom and be saved by that message of the kingdom. That I find enormously instructive. Luke 8, 12. So you have a wonderful thing to ponder for weeks now, not just today. And begin teaching this to your friends, this passage. And you'll find it, I think, eye-opening. The kingdom of God gospel is everything. You have to obey that. You have to believe the words of Jesus and his sayings. Otherwise, you're not going to be saved. That's why Jesus said, you remember that very, very alarming statement in Matthew, where he said, multitudes of people will say in the future, Lord, Lord, Look at the things we did. Look at the preaching we did for you. Look at the miracles we did for you. All the wonderful works we did for you. Only be to be greeted with these chilling words. Get out of here. I never knew you. I find that very challenging. So if you want not to be saved, you work hard at avoiding the words of Jesus. If you want to be saved and brought into the kingdom for indestructible life, or immortality in that future kingdom on earth, then you have to believe in the words of Jesus and carry them out. None of us does it perfectly. We need forgiveness. I understand that. But we better at least accept the idea that salvation is based firstly on the teachings of Jesus. So that passage in John 12, verses 44 I recommend for constant reading for several weeks yet until you are absolutely sure you've got it and then share it with other people and you'll find they find that interesting too. The best way to learn something, as we teachers all know, is to teach it to someone else. Once you teach it to someone else, it lets you know how well you understand it your, yourself. So please engage these wonderful words in John. 12, 44 to 50. There could be no more lucid, devastatingly clear summary of the difference between salvation and lack of salvation. I remind you that in Hebrews 2, verse 3, I do want to turn to that one. Hebrews 2, 3 says what I've been trying to say here, that salvation had its beginning in the teaching of Jesus. That's in Hebrews 2, verse 3. Uh, Hebrews 2 
and verse 3, where we have a similar warning. It fits in beautifully with the passage we're doing in John. In verse 2 of Hebrews 2, he says, if the word or message spoken through angels proved unalterable, so this gospel that we're talking about is unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a penalty, fair warning, how will we Christians escape? How can we possibly escape as believers, as Christians, if we neglect so great a salvation? We're talking here about gaining life forever and ever and ever. We're talking here about not dying and remaining alive after the resurrection forever and ever and ever. If that doesn't get your attention, nothing will. So in Hebrews 2, 3, that salvation was at first spoken through the Lord Jesus. I get it. Jesus is the one you want to go to to define the gospel. That salvation had its beginning. The Greek is even more explicit than the English here. The Greek says this salvation, which on pain of death we must not neglect, was first spoken, had its beginning in the teachings of Jesus. And it was then confirmed to us by those who heard Jesus preaching that gospel. And how did God confirm it? He testified with them those people who heard and reported the gospel as Jesus had preached it, and he confirmed it by extraordinary signs and wonders and a variety of miracles and gifts of Holy Spirit according to his will. Now, you don't necessarily expect that God will do all of those stupendous miracles constantly. You know, when you start a new venture, let's say, say you open a business, you put out the balloons and you have a tremendous uh, operation going on the first day. You don't repeat that every day of the existence of your business. So I don't think we're seeing today the dead being called out of the grave on the scale that we see in the New Testament. Not to say that God cannot and does not intervene in your life in various ways. I'm sure he does. But... That seems to refer to those early apostolic days where you had apostles. We don't have any apostles with a capital A today. That's impossible. The reason is that to be an apostle, you have to have seen literally the resurrected Jesus. That's what Paul defined as the signs of an apostle. And the signs of an apostle were the extraordinary miracles that Peter and Paul were able to, to affirm. So you can ponder that. Now, this does not mean, I repeat, that God does not intervene and cannot and will not, that he will not intervene in any way in your life. That would be quite false. God, I'm sure, is very active in the lives of all of his true believers, men and women alike. But you do have an apostolic level of miracles here referred to, which cannot be repeated. You are unlikely and if I'm proven wrong, that will be amazing. You're unlikely to raise the dead today. Doesn't mean that God is not heavily involved in what you do. That's true. But allow for the apostolic level of extraordinary miracles. Firstly, in Jesus' seven signs, miracles in the Gospel of John. Later, where Peter actually raised Dorcas from death. You remember that. Those things are not likely to be repeated now. But the miracle of the resurrection, as John has been teaching us, will happen to all the believers of all times when he comes back at his parousia, that's the Greek word for his second coming. And it really means a coming because we've been asked this week by some who don't really believe in the second coming. They think that Jesus is not coming back, really. They think he's coming back in the sky and then he'll go off to heaven and take the saints to heaven. That is absolutely false. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back to the earth. That's why he said himself, blessed are the meek. They're going to have the earth or the land, terra firma, this globe, as their inheritance. Jesus is the late and final King David. 
And the Lord God, I remind you without turning to it, the Lord God will give Jesus the throne of his ancestor David. That's clear. That's not the throne at Buckingham Palace. It's not the throne in another country. It's the throne in Israel. So as long as Jesus is not sitting on the throne of David and of Israel, in Israel, the second coming hasn't happened. But when he does come back, he's going to reside as the rightful king of the whole world. That's the whole point of his gospel of the kingdom. And if you want backup text on that, you'll find that in Revelation 20, verse 9, the camp of the saints, where are the saints residing? It's on the earth, in the land. That's where you're going to reside. So forget all talk about going to heaven when you die. You're just promoting a falsehood if you do. Nobody goes to heaven when they die in Scripture. Even Enoch and Elijah, who were caught away temporarily, eventually died. And for that, you're going to consult Hebrews chapter 11, which says that all the prophets, including Enoch and Elijah, all the famous heroes of the Old Testament times, they all died. They all died, including David. David did not go to heaven. That's what it says in Acts clearly. So if you're unclear about that, please do read our little booklet called What Happens When We Die, free at our site. It's in, I think, 12 languages now. So you can consult that and you will find that death means that you are dead. When you die, you are actually dead. You're said to be sleeping. And the key verse for that is Daniel 12, verse 2. It tells you what you're doing when you die. You are so-called sleeping, not literally sleeping, but you are unconscious. And you're doing that in the dust of the ground. You return to the dust from which you were made. Your only solution, that's what we talk about here on these programs week by week, your only relief from that sleep of death is to be resurrected at the future coming of Jesus when he's coming back to the earth. Don't let anybody tell you that he's going back to heaven. That destroys the gospel, unfortunately. So you've got a lot of work to do to suggest to people in a kindly way that some of what they learned in church might not be exactly the truth. So do we have any points that people have raised, Carlos, or what? Yep. Thank you, Anthony, for that uh, commentary. Very interesting, uh, amazing passage yeah, here in uh, John is. 12. Amazing. I neglected to mention to the live mm. audience, if you have any questions, please type them in all caps. I yes. see a couple, and mm. we will go to some of your questions. Good. But I'd like to expand on this a little bit. Yes. If you don't mind, Anthony. Of course. Please and do. our viewers do not mind. This is such a amazing passage yes and you're right um i i did have time this morning to uh look at this passage uh, closer good um and let me make some comments here mm -hmm. about do. it mm -hmm. uh, but first let, let let me tell you that for some time now uh reading doing our bible studies here with, with the gospel of john it occurred to me that the new testament doesn't really say things like believe Jesus died and you will be saved. You know, it doesn't like quite say it in those words. It does say things obviously like uh, Romans, I think Romans 9 is it or 10. Mm -hmm. uh, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. Yes. You know, uh, I guess the death is implying his resurrection, but it's oh, yeah. different, yeah. Uh, a little bit different to to say, you know, believe that Jesus was raised by God from the dead, mm -hmm. as opposed to believe Jesus died for you and you will be saved. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned here, you make some interesting points about the emphasis uh, John places on mm -hmm. the words of Jesus mm -hmm. that are the words of the Father, of course. Yes. And that is salvation. Yes. That, that is very clear here. You said... Uh, something along the lines of yes the the cross is important very important you know we have Central. to yeah we have to confess the cross talk about the cross teach about the cross the blood yes. of christ we've done teachings on the new covenant which is all about yes. the new covenant blood 
Um, yes. <clears throat> but the words of Jesus, like it's a special emphasis, if you yes. will. Yeah. Uh, am I on the right track here? I think you are. We should fully concede that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul spoke about the gospel and he spoke about the death and resurrection of Jesus. So you absolutely must believe in the death, the sacrificial atoning death of Jesus, and you must absolutely believe in his resurrection. Otherwise, there's no gospel. But what people don't notice is that in that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, I'm telling you about things of first importance. He didn't say that's the whole gospel. So your job then as one sharing with other people is to show that in Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, those two verses, Acts chapter 20, verse 24 and 25, Paul equates the gospel of the grace of God with the gospel of the kingdom. I think there could be no doubt in anybody's mind that those two verses would change the face of a lot of people's beliefs. Acts 20, verse 24 and 25 where Paul says, summarizing his own career, by the way, he said, I went about preaching the gospel of the grace of God. People stopped there. No, no, read the next verse, which says that the preaching of that gospel of grace is exactly the same as preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Luke, very cleverly, Luke, who wrote more of the New Testament probably than anybody else, if you exclude Hebrews, doesn't matter, Exactly, but Luke massively reports the true Christian faith, and he is busy telling you in Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, that the gospel of the grace of God is precisely the same as the gospel of the kingdom, because it's very gracious of God to offer you a kingdom. You obey me, Jesus, and God the Father, for whom he speaks. If you obey me and serve me, I'm going to give you a reward that you won't believe. That is absolutely unparalleled. It's called a reward. You're going to receive the reward of the inheritance. That's in Colossians 3.24. Throw that one in too. Putting these verses together, the reward is stupendous. But it's only on condition that you read, understand, and obey the teachings of Jesus and of Paul, who, of course, represents Jesus particularly in Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, and also, also in Acts 19, 8, you will find that Paul is busy arguing the kingdom of God from dawn till dusk. That's the whole point of the Christian faith. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, thanks, Ante. I have a, a quick PowerPoint mm. here, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to help. Uh, it helps with the uh, notes I have here. Uh, just trying to look for this. So <clears throat> these are just some, some musings from me. Verse 34, the crowd responded, we have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. It's interesting, right? Because in Luke 1, the angel says, as we know, that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. This, of course, echoes the famous 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 and 16, your house, this is the promise Yahweh God makes to David. And of course, the Messiah is the seed of David, descendant. Your house, your kingdom will endure forever. So there's this obvious forever kingdom. If the kingdom is forever, guess who is forever? The, the king of the <laughs> coming kingdom. And I think you mentioned the famous Psalm 89, verses 4, 29, and 37. I will establish, says God, your seed forever. So I think that's. That's clearly what this uh, John 12, 34 is a reference to. In 36, it's interesting that Jesus says, believe in the light and become sons of light. Now, this obviously has to take you back to chapter one of the gospel. In verses nine and 10, we see how Jesus is what the light became. Uh, there's a he there, the, and I'll get you, Anthony, to comment if you want on, on especially John 1.10, but now the light becomes a he. He was in the world, it says. So this is preparing us for the climax, if you will, of verse 14. The word becomes flesh. 
In other words, the word becomes a human person. <clears throat> and it's interesting that following in verse 11 in John 1, just this theme of persistent unbelief isn't there. And it's similar to what John says in, in John chapter 12, verses 37 and 38, where it says that even though Jesus performed all these miracles, these signs, uh, who is going to believe the, the message, the gospel message, that is? And um, if I may just quickly hear, let me see if I can get John 1, because John 1 is, is very interesting, this connection. You see there, the true light, verse 9, using the NRSV, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. That's birth language, by the way. To come into the world means you are being born or you will be born. To come out of the world or go out of the world simply means you die, you're dead. It doesn't mean you literally go somewhere. <clears throat> and then that verse 10 I was talking about, he was in the world, now it changes to a he. So we go from it, the logos was, is, is an it, the light is an it. And then we come to a, he was in the world, the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. So that's a big change. And then that unbelief I was talking about in verse 11, his own people did not accept him, which is the theme, the same theme uh, of John 12, verses 37, 38. And there's an interesting connection here to the Qumran community, if you'd like to look at that further, where they viewed themselves as the sons of light over against the sons of darkness. Many scholars, people point to the fact that there might have been a connection with this Qumran community that was a Jewish sort of sect that lived in the desert. Some even connect John the Baptist to this community, who knows? But their writings are very obviously messianic. Uh, when it comes to Jewish apocalyptic view is very similar, of course, to Jesus. Then Anthony, as you mentioned, verse 38, the arm of the Lord, which is a Hebrew idiom, as you said, for the power of God. You could say it's the power of the gospel. Uh, Romans 1, Paul talks about how it is the power of God to save, to salvation, the gospel about the kingdom. Similarly, in 1 Corinthians 1. And the arm of the Lord, obviously, is, is um, um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Is this uh, typified, is represented by, obviously, the Messiah. And this is against some pre-existence people. Believe it or not, uh, I'm, you know, I, I debate uh, once in a while, as you know, and some actually say that Jesus pre-existed literally as the arm of the Lord. Uh, so that's quite an amazing jump. Uh, in verses 37 to 40, it's interesting. Some people do not believe because they're not allowed to believe. As you said, Anthony, this has nothing to do with Calvinism, and we'll get to that. Similarly, in Mark 4, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, says Jesus, to his apostles, the 12, but to those outside, everything is said in parables. So that, and then he goes back to that Isaiah passage. They may be ever seeing, never perceiving, that is understanding, ever hearing, never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, obviously, this is not some uh, Calvinism from John being introduced. The, uh, what's it called? Irresistible. Uh, attraction or something. No, because as you mentioned, Anthony, God, yes, it's true, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Exodus 4, because the Pharaoh hardened his own heart, Exodus 8 and, and 32 there. There's a similar example, as you know, in Deuteronomy 29, it says that God has not given Israel a mind to understand, eyes to see, ears to hear. That's interesting. However, it goes on to say in verse 9, Israel is warned to be careful to do the words of this covenant. So why would God give a warning if he's already set this in stone that they will never understand, they will never hear? And similarly, in John 12, 42, if we go back there, it goes on to say, John, that nevertheless, 
So even though John said what he said, alluding to the Isaiah passage, they will never understand, they will never hear. But nevertheless, many, perhaps even many of his own enemies at the time, believed in Jesus. Again, this shows that the, they could not believe of John 12, 39 is not a hard, fast rule, if you will. It's not an absolutist statement because obviously it's qualified by these other statements <clears throat> where even perhaps some of the enemies of Jesus repent and actually go on to believe that he's the Messiah. The famous verse 41, I thought you covered it uh, well, but let me say this. So Isaiah said these things because he saw the glory of the Messiah and spoke about it or spoke about him, the Messiah. Well, <clears throat> the glory of God is the glory of his Messiah. We, we see this throughout the gospels, Matthew 16, 27, and Matthew 24, 30, 25, 31. Look at this interesting parallel. In the first, it says that the Son of Man, Jesus, will return in the glory of his Father. But then later in the chapter, in the gospel, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. So which is it? Is it he's coming in the glory of, his, of someone else, the Father? Is it that he's coming in his own? It doesn't matter. It's one in the same glory. By the way, we share, we partake of that same glory. Uh, for that, we will read in, as you know, in John chapter 17. <clears throat> and of note is the fact that like Isaiah, the prophet Abraham, and the prophet saw the glory of the Messiah, uh, Abraham, of course, is said to have rejoiced at seeing the day of the Messiah, which is synonymous. The day of the Messiah is seeing the glory of the Messiah, of course. And that's in that John 8, 56, and the prophets in 1 Peter 1 as well. <clears throat> Verse 44, you mentioned this, Anthony. This is fundamental. I forgot who it was. Was it uh, Dr. Carson who said this is, if you don't get the agency principle, uh, the Hebrew word shaliach, we always talk about, means a representative. If you don't understand this in Christology, in the study of the Messiah, you're going to get lost. Um, whoever believes me does not believe me, but the one who sent me. So this is what's known as a synonymous parallelism, describing this well-known principle of agency. That's the Hebrew word shaliach. By the way, the Greek is an apostle, apostle, apostolos. <clears throat> one sent is as he who sent him. Now, we see this as well in the following verses, in verses 48 and 49. Well, Jesus says something that sounds contradictory, but it's really not if we follow the principle. He says, I do not judge. The word I have spoken will judge you. But wait a minute. He is the word become flesh, Jesus. So is he contradicting himself? No. He's simply making the broader important point that he is the agent of someone else, the one God the Father. And it, it is the words or commandments of the Father that he gave to his son Jesus to speak that will judge us all. So again, it's this principle of agency and there's other examples throughout the gospels. Mark 9, 37 makes, uh, it, it's a parallel really, Mark 9, 37, parallel to John 12, 44. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. You see there? So now it's about welcoming Jesus. It's about believing Jesus. They're synonymous things. John 13, 20, whoever receives the one I sent receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now we're getting beyond the supreme agent of Jesus to guess who? You and me, Christians. Now we are shaliachs, if that's the word, uh, uh, representatives, agents of God through his son. And then Luke 10, 16, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects, rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. You see there, it's not contradictory at all. 
if we get this fundamental principle known as agency. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any comments. Well, just, uh, just as we're getting to the end of our time here, why don't we include Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, which gives us this command to choose life, which is a great theme of John. You have to choose life. If God says choose, and in fact, he's really decided ahead of time what he's going to do, he's lying to you. That's very serious. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I, God, have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. I find that very compelling. That's Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses yeah. That's exactly that's exactly no. what Jesus is saying in John 12, isn't exactly. it? Look, I'm giving you a choice. Yes. It's not a it's not that you know God has closed your ears or eyes. Right. No, no, you be careful not to close your ears and eyes because God will further uh ensnare yeah. you in your own unbelief. That's right. So uh we have some comments, Anthony, before yeah. we uh sorry, questions uh, before yeah, no good. We that's go. Great. I like your explanation. Um, Very good. Let's see, uh, Michelle says, so God blinds the eyes of those whose hearts are not open to him and his message. If they want to learn, then God will open their minds. It's two sides of the coin. It's no good expressing one side of the coin. The other side of the coin are those verses which says you are to choose. If you're not going to choose, God will show you what it's like to be blind. If you say, I'm not going to see, I'm, I'm not going to study, I'm not going to learn, then God will blind you. So one must, I think, always keep in mind two sides of the coin. And you can quote verses on either side of the coin to the exclusion of the other one. But it simply is a fact that you're asked to choose. God invites you to choose. Pharaoh hardened his heart. It also says in the same chapter that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So which is it? Two sides of the coin. That just takes a little bit of thinking. We do have free will. Now, not free will to do exactly what we want to do. I don't have any free will to be um, in offices in America. So I'm not even a citizen. I enjoy the status of a green card person. I don't have free will to do that. But I do have free will to choose to obey God or not to. So I think it's the principle of two sides of the coin that has to be explained here. Choosing is impossible. <clears throat> If right. you're not making a choice. So God would be lying. He says, choose. Well, you're not really choosing. And then I'm lying to you. No, no. That's out of the question. Thank you, Anthony. Choice. And um, yeah. good. Sarah's Thank you. Good sharing, question. Sarah's Appreciate sharing question. Uh, Matthew 13, 15. Yes. These people's heart has grown dull. Yes. Their good. ears are hard of hearing. So yes. there's already a process of unbelief yes. by the person. So it's personal yes. choice, personal responsibility. That's very good. But be warned because God will make it worse. Yes. So uh, let's go to another one from yes. Nancy. Would I say I have believed in the Trinity or that Jesus was God himself? Well, it's an interesting question. And the answer is absolutely no. Everybody knows or should know that the Jewish people were always believes, believing in the one God, the Father. No, he wouldn't have heard of that. He would, If he had, he would have rejected it immediately. What in the world would suggest that? Because God says in the Bible thousands of times, I am God, there's no one else beside me. I alone am God. I'm absolutely alone. Nobody's with me as God. I am God. And then they report that as saying, you should believe in him. That's a singular personal pronoun. Him, himself. Think of the one in Isaiah 44, 24. It says, I, God, created everything by myself. If that's not clear, nothing is clear. So let your children hear those ones and enjoy them. So I think with great respect to Nancy, the answer would be completely not, because that would be two gods. And we don't right. want to believe in two gods. So stick and with the Shema. And the interesting thing in Isaiah 6, which yes. is often brought up yes. as as if, by the way, yes, uh, John 12 mm -hmm. is citing uh, mm -hmm. Isaiah 6 mm -hmm. in full, mm -hmm. uh, which he doesn't. He he alludes to verse 10. Yes. Uh, uh, John 12, 40, uh, what is it? 41. John 12, 40 mm -hmm. alludes to the yes. 
But if you note here, it's actually um, the first verses here. Yes. Uh, that, that Those verses are not being cited. Uh, in other words, Isaiah is not saying, I saw the Lord Jesus sitting on a throne. No, no. No. <laughs> um, no. So that's important to note. Yes. Uh, next question here, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, sorry, everyone. I'm trying to keep up mm -hmm. with the chat. Um, can Jesus give new teachings to believers today through the Holy Spirit beyond his words as recorded in the Gospels? Well, that's an interesting question. My answer would be, I, and I, I think the only possible answer would be, he cannot contradict what he's given before. He's given us the fullness of the new covenant, and he didn't give it all in one day. He allowed some of it to come through Paul. So he couldn't contradict can God and Jesus guide you in special ways affecting your life? Of course he can. You've got to be careful not to assume, but you work hard in prayer at asking God for decisions. So I think if, if that means, can he contradict what he said? He's not going to change the law of divorce. He already changed it. You know, Jesus said that Moses said you could have a divorce for certain reasons in Deuteronomy 22. But I'm telling you something different. You cannot have that excuse for a divorce because from the beginning, Moses didn't say that. From the beginning, God said something different. So there's a, 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 a change quite clearly. But it's a very interesting question, Rick. Thank you for that, Brundrett. Rick yeah, Brundrett. I think, yeah. if I may add, Anthony, mm. uh, we believe in the, uh, I don't know if it has a name, but we believe the canon is closed. Yes. Uh, all prophecies pertaining the the major prophecies about the parousia, who mm -hmm. God in Christ are, the kingdom, the gospel, and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, the day of the Lord, we believe that's yes. closed. In other words, if someone comes and says, "Oh, actually, you know what? This this is added." So, yes. if there's an addition, like the Mormons have done, mm. if there's what do they call it, a further revelation yes. of Jesus or something? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't believe, obviously, in that. No. So that goes for, you know, so-called mainstream Protestant yes. Catholic. Uh, or Although although Catholics do have extra uh, books of their own, right, that yes. they follow. So. The Apocrypha. But that's clear that Jesus <clears throat> believed in the Old Testament canon of Scripture. He talks about Scripture as a fixed thing that they knew right. had limits to it. And likewise, in the New, they talk about Scripture to indicate Paul's writings. So we know right. Paul's writings of scripture. It follows logically that you cannot, God cannot speak to us if there are no limits to where he speaks. And so right. I think the answer is quite clearly that they speak of New Testament scripture and Old Testament scripture. That's yeah, I the think the word uh, fixed is, is yes. very well, well mm -hmm. placed there. Uh, one yes. last one. It's a dumb question alert. Mm. But uh, do Jews believe the Messiah <laughs> needs to be a man? Absolutely. I think they never, ever doubted that. It was from Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. That word seed means the progeny, the product of the woman. It never occurred to anybody that the Messiah would be other than a human being because their own kings were called messiahs. As I mentioned earlier today, even... Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I think Psalm 104, those famous patriarchs are referred to as messiahs. So messiah is simply a human being. And in Jesus' case, he has to be a physical lineal descendant of David. And that can only be through his mother, because we know that he had no human father. So logically, the Jews certainly never thought that Jesus would be other than the descendant of David, a man, indeed, the man, Messiah Jesus. Let me finish with this text. There's one God, the Father, Paul said, and one mediator between that one God and man, who is the man. Those apostles were very smart. They're trying to prevent what later became so confusing. All right. Okay. Thank you, Anthony, for your comments uh, there. Thanks for the questions. Apologies if I missed any. Here's another good text to take home on this topic, Acts 28, 27. For this people's heart has grown dull. Their eyes are hard of hearing. Uh, their ears, sorry, are harder. They have shut, they have shut their eyes 
otherwise they might see and so forth. I think also in the book of Acts, uh, Luke talks about how um, the Pharisees, the unbelieving, those unbelieving Jews have counted themselves unworthy of the inheritance of the kingdom. That's why Paul and, and Peter go to us, to the Gentiles. Next door, if you will. Um, here's another good comment from my wife, Sarah. John 12, 45 is a good example of seeing, meaning understanding in John. For example, we can say we see God, so we understand uh, the things of God. So, all right, uh, let me see if I'm leaving anything. Oh, yes, uh, I forgot. I had a comment here, a summation of John 12. Uh, this is from the Word Biblical Commentary. There are clear connections between this representation of the mission of Jesus and the expectation of the coming prophet like Moses, Deuteronomy 18. Moses gave the people the words and commands of God, the people there, Israel, and in the light of these commandments, he called on them to choose between life and death, as Anthony said, Deuteronomy 30. While Moses was known as the first redeemer, Jesus is not simply the second, but the final scatological, that's a big word saying, future times, end times, redeemer. <clears throat> so that's, I think, well sums up this chapter 12. Apologies for not progressing further in the chapter, uh, but it's a very, very good chapter there. We had to... Uh, <laughs> expand it a little bit. Uh, this Thursday, um, before we sign off, join Anthony and Tracy will host Anthony on the secrets of the kingdom of God. I put the link in the chat uh, for this Saturday, uh, Thursday, as it says, June 9th, 7 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. It's a live discussion. Uh, there will be interaction obviously with the audience so if you have any questions for anthony join him this thursday and that's on the kingdom of god missions ministry youtube channel and there's the link i put the link in the chat and that's the main link there so please tune in for that thanks again to anthony and um, we will close now with prayer Father, we pray for the um, situation around the world, the wars in going on, the conflicts, if you will, in Russia, Ukraine, our brothers and sisters always, Maxim especially, and the other brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We pray for Tracy and her ministry that uh, she continues to help uh, with the communication there with, with the Russian people and Ukraine people. We pray for uh, the sick, the the sick among us. Uh, we've have uh, many petitions, and you know them, Father. You know who needs uh, healing at this moment. I'm especially thinking of Michael or Mike in Germany, <clears throat> asking for uh, prayers there. We thank you for Anthony and his health, and Barbara. Uh, please help her with that uh, incessant cough, and uh, we thank you. Uh, myself, my wife, for our health and bringing us safe from the two weeks we were off. Uh, we pray for those less fortunate than us always, Father. And may we be able to preach, continue to preach this incredible hope of the resurrection in the coming kingdom of God on earth. And we say amen in the name of your son, Jesus. Until we meet again, God bless and be safe.